Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. This is our weekly program featuring everything that is coming up in the area's music, arts, and entertainment scene. We will interview local artists, authors, musicians, and even some nationally recognized names who may be performing here in our area. We will have movie reviews and film suggestions from the real dad, Mark Schumann, and etiquette tips from Catherine Michaels. This is your all-access pass, and here are your hosts. Arts and Leisure editor Sally Sanders and our entertainment reporter Steve Coulter. Welcome to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. I'm your host Steve Coulter. I'm joined here on the couch by our real dad Mark Schumann. <laughs> Sally's on vacation this week. And we're finally back. It's been a two-week hiatus without talking about movies. It has, and, and, I, and I, 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 I actually, I wish there was more to catch up yeah. on. I, you know, we're we're still in this post-Oscar, almost summer limbo you call it period. The haze, the haze of the this, film. This season. limbo period, and and there there are some interesting things that have come out, but we're still kind of on the cusp. And I'm, we're happy today to talk about musical biopics. Right. Last uh, summer, we did this when before we got onto live video. Now we're going to be talking about Miles Ahead, which you saw in the fall, and kind of comparing it to some other uh, musical biopics of the last year, straight out of Compton, Love and Mercy, and uh, Youth, which was another musical film, not a biopic. But there were some music ones that came out last year. Miles Ahead, I think, was your least favorite, or was Youth your least favorite? I, I, I think Youth is just torture, so <laughs> I don't think that can even count. Miles Ahead is, fa is fascinating, because you have, on one hand, you have the, the wonderful Don Cheadle, who is certainly passionate about telling this story. He co-wrote the film, he, directed, he directed the it. film, and he's in every, he's in every frame of the film, and he's very good. He's such a good actor and so commanding. The challenge is that Miles there Ahead the New York faces the same challenge that anyone who creates a musical biopic faces, and that is they all kind of have the same plot. Somewhere from obscurity, the music emerges and someone becomes a star. Then mayhem has to ensue and we have to have challenge, whether it's competitive challenge, chemical challenge. And then you've got to find meaning in the Couple third challenge, act, right? whatever it is. And then in some way they have to redeem and you have to find meaning. Right. So the, the story arc in a musical biopic hasn't really changed since the 30s and the 40s when you had these old films like The Great Ziegfeld and Yankee Doodle Dandy. They never quite know what to do in the third act. The first act is pretty easy. The star is discovered. The second act is pretty easy. The star is troubled. The third act... <laughs> drug, where, drug, drug addiction, or romance, family problems. Or whatever it is, ambition, right. whatever it is. And the third act is always the challenge. And the, So sometimes they, they work around that. Love and Mercy last year, which prompted, I think, when we talked about this before, did a wonderful job of taking a chapter, or actually two chapters, and putting them against each right, other. Right, the 60s in version the of Paul Dano, of, the of, Beach of Brian Wilson, and was, John Cusack in the late 80s. It was great, because it, it used these two kind of opposing stories as a way to, to shed light on this group. Straight Outta Compton focuses more on the, the, the emergence of the performers. Miles Ahead tries to do what many biopics are now trying to do. Let's don't tell the entire story. Let's just pick this one piece in time. Part of the challenge is that when you only pick a piece in time, where does the backstory emerge from? We have to know why we're there. We have to know why we just woke up with Miles Davis and he has empty bottles in his apartment and my, that's a cool spiral staircase. We have to know why we're there, and so how does the movie tell us why we're there? In this case... The screenplay doesn't have any flashbacks. Well, it, 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 it has this framing device of this reporter who shows it's up. It's Ewan McGregor's and, character. And, he, and he's quite good. He's, yeah. he's quite oh, good. The cast is phenomenal. Yeah. You have Michael Strubler yeah. as well. He's a great actor. He's great. But, but this frame it, it doesn't necessarily feel very real. It's real convenient for this reporter to show up with his <laughs> tape recorder, tell me the story of your life. It, it's a little bit convenient. And, and many times over the years, music biopics have been guilty of the very convenient framing. It's kind device. of a lazy way to do it. It is. Right? Yeah. It is. It is. You know, uh, whether you know, we've had biopics where the star has watched a documentary of her life. Well, that's pretty easy. Or the star walks into the theater and has the flashbacks of her life. Uh, the this feels like one of those. It feels very convenient. 
The other thing is we never get the sense because we pick a few days when Davis is challenged. We never get the excitement of what it had to be like when he was discovered. So we get the agony without the ecstasy. And, and so we just don't ever so there's get no the, rise. We don't get the, yeah. the rush of the rise. Mm -hmm. And biopics need the rush of the rise for us to believe the complexity oh, sure. of the that's challenge. The, that's the best part yeah. of Straight Outta Compton. It's Right. And so you go back to what I think is one of the best biopics, musical biopics, is Sissy Spacex, Coal Miner's Daughter. Because it's certainly, by telling a, a, a linear story, it doesn't try to do anything tricky with a, with a framing device. But it really does show us the rise and what in the character led to the rise. It's very detailed in its, its look at the complexities. And she has complexities in her relationships. She has complexities in, in adjusting to fame. And, and then it doesn't give us just a real happy ending. It suggests that, you know, maybe things will be okay, but it's not a happily ever after. It's not sunshines and, no, sh no. Yeah, sunshine and, and, and rainbows. And, and most of all, she gives us a reason for the music. Another challenge that, that music biopics have is, well, it's a music biopic, we want to have music, but unless the music emerges from the story, unless there's a reason for someone to sing or someone to perform, the movie doesn't quite work. So in this case, one of the frustrations with Miles Ahead is you want to hear the music because Miles Davis was such a significant musician. And it's very awkward to find ways in the film for the music to emerge. And you want the music to emerge. Now, is there a chance that because you saw it in October and it still is not out, we're in April of 2016, it's been seven months, that this movie has gone through editing and has changed? So I don't the, know. the version that you saw in New York is going to be different than the one that people I, see this month when the film comes I, I, out. I, have, I, I haven't compared the sure. writing times to, to know. I, I, I don't know. Could be. And Could it's interesting because there's another movie that's actually playing now about a famous trumpeter, Chet Baker, Born to be Blue with Ethan Hawke. And that movie has now came out before Miles Ahead. And, and, and it's supposed to be quite good. It's supposed oh, yeah. to be quite good. Yeah. It's playing at, I think, uh, in New York, and it's also playing in Norwalk, Jacob Burns Center. Yeah. So if people yeah. want to check that one out, that and, one's in theaters. Miles and Ahead Ethan is Hawk coming is out such soon. An, he's such an interesting actor that I would think that it could be quite compelling. I, and, and, and you want these films to be made. You want the biopic because we are curious about what's behind the lives of people whose music we admire. We yeah. want to hear it. And, 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 but you also want it to be told with a, with a degree of creativity. Yeah. Some challenge, some difficulty. Some challenge. You don't want to go as far as some of the true disastrous music biopics. I have my list of the ones. That Should we start with the bad ones or the good ones first? Oh well, yeah, let's, well, yeah, we, <laughs> we can, or we can do a. Well, one we were talking good, about it. Bad. We were talking one about good, it in the, bad. before we started. Uh, By the Sea is there's I, too many connections between Miles Ahead and By the Sea. They're both passion projects. Uh, Kevin Spacey did By you know, the I, Sea we love about Kevin ten years Spacey. ago. We love it when he chews scenery. I, I, he's not a singer. No. And and he doesn't kind of give you that 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 musical performing vibe. But apparently loved Bar Bobby Darren. Bobby Darren's story is certainly one that is worth telling. The trouble with that movie is you aren't quite sure if it's about Bobby Darren or if it's about Kevin Spacey and his love for Bobby <laughs> Darren. It's a mess. Well, it's that's just what you find when you have these passion projects, yeah, when the guy's writing, directing, and acting. Yeah, it's The key a, to it is you can't do all three. Well, you, some people can. The challenge is you have to somehow in that collaborative process with yourself, you need someone to challenge what you're doing. And Checks and balance, and, yeah, so to someone speak. Someone has to say, you know, that might be one too many close-ups of you, <laughs> Kevin. If you watch By the Sea, count the close-ups. It's like the whole movie is done in this, you know, we just study every crevice. And uh, yeah, that isn't really what we want. We he, doesn't, learn he hasn't much returned about to being a director since then, I don't think. I don't think so. I, think it, well. I don't think it did very well. Speaking of uh, better ones, let's let's change the topic and make it for some of the better ones. Almost Famous, oh, I'm Not There, I think we can agree, are two I, of our favorites. I'm Not There, and what's marvelous about it. Now that's I, one that challenges the audience and it's a challenge to the filmmaker, Absolutely, I mean the idea that you would have multiple people playing playing Bob Dylan. And, there they are, Christian Bale, including, Heath Ledger, yeah, okay. Kate Blanchett. Yeah, including a woman. Ben Winishaw, Richard but, Gere. But what it does is by doing that, Todd Haynes, he, he gave us this very 
complex view of a complex man and suggested to us that there is no one perception of anybody. Different people see different people when they see someone. Now, did it, Todd Haynes, it really works. Did Todd Haynes, by playing that card and doing the movie that he did, did he kind of... No other filmmaker could copy it, though, because otherwise they're just going to be saying be, that they're copying well, with, him. Yeah, but the trouble is that you can just read the reviews, as Tom Haynes did in I'm Not There. Right. And that movie... Like, I would have loved to have seen Walk the Line done like that. Johnny I would have Cash. liked to have seen Walk the Line done anyway, other than the way that it was done. <laughs> I just... Talk about... You, know, the, you, don't, like, I, you don't like Joaquin Phoenix's performance? I thought he was quite good. I thought Reese Witherspoon, one of the least deserved Oscars <laughs> ever awarded... Surely there there could have been something else done. That she should year. have played Johnny Cash. They should have had five or six of them. The, the problem is that, that is as typical a, a biopic as there can be. You know, the I'm I'm rising, I'm falling. Yeah, I'm you have the music, the mayhem, and the music. And and and, 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 the, and the performing sequences in that film don't feel like they're real. You don't feel any. Of, of, of what we used to feel when we would see those performers on stage, which is one of the challenges that the music biopic has is that, it, especially today in the YouTube world, it's really easy to say, I'd like to go see footage of the real Miles Davis and see what he was like to watch, or in this case, the real Johnny Cash, and I'd like to see them. What's interesting about Walk the Line is that it was just a few years between that and Ray. And, it was and, back to back, Ray and, was and, 2004. And Ray, could have been the most conventional of musical biopics that we've seen, partly because of the command of the performance, but also the, 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 the layers of, of, of the filmmaking. It was far more interesting. You really got such a look at the context that created this man, not just the challenges that he overcame. Are there any others that you'd like to recommend to people while they're on the couch this weekend with the cold weather? With the cold weather, I would go back to La Vienne Rose. Oh, of course. With Marianne Cotillard. I could that one. Uh, the story of Edith Piaf, and of course, a very tragic story, but so beautifully performed. I would go back um, a couple hundred years to Amadeus. Amadeus is great. Amadeus, and what's marvelous about Amadeus... Milos Forman. Uh, again... It, these are about music, and, and, and the music in Amadeus is so beautifully performed and emerges so naturally that we really think we get to know Mozart, the composer, and we can feel the tension And between. the structure of the screenplay is also right. very innovative. It's not this it, no, it cookie-cutter formula. It has a flashback. You yep. do have Salieri and his... Oh, but it's so well played. It's, it's so you well almost forget played. about it, and, that and it plays like a thriller. Right, it, it, it isn't. And then we did this, and then we did this, and then we did this. Oh, it's very much a thriller, mm -hmm. I think, as very, much as it is very about fabulous film. The biopic itself, um, and I would pick one that um, some people may have forgotten. It's called Bound for Glory, and it's the story of Woody Guthrie, the folk singer who, um, this land is your land. Some of the great Americana folk songs of all times. It's a lovely film because it talks about the era of time, the Depression, when his music meant so much. So it is as much about the moment in time when the musician made a difference as it is about the musician himself. That's why I love Eight Mile. I have you know, it. It's not I've a conventional, bi list it's not a conventional biopic, but it, you just feel I've been to Detroit. Yeah. And that's what I love about it. I feel and the like music's I've been there. so good in Oh, that the music's too. fabulous. The music's fabulous. And while we're talking about folk music inside Lewin Davis a couple years ago, we talked about that when we were highlighting the Coen <sighs> brothers I back in February, film. but that yeah. was a great one. I love that film. Frank with Michael Fassbender is another one if people have time that's on Netflix. Mm. I'd highly recommend that it's a very odd movie, but it's, very, it's an interesting very, look at a... Uh, very odd movie. And then there's some, the there's, isolated there's musician. some old classics that, uh, depending on how awful the weather <laughs> is, you should go back and find. Uh, Lady Sings the Blues mm -hmm. with Diana Ross. It's, it's somewhat cookie cutter, but Diana Ross is so moving in that film. It's just, it's just lovely. I think, um, I think Barbara Streisand's Funny Girl, which is essentially a music biopic, I think is really good. And then I would go back to, uh, the other one I would pick is What's Love Got to Do With It? The story of Ike and Tina Turner. Yeah. Very perfect. Yeah. And and so there's, there's some recommendations for you to watch this weekend while you're home. Tribeca Film Festival is coming next it week. Is. Next it Wednesday is. it kicks it off is. the 13th and runs through the 24th. Three movies really quickly before we head to commercial break. Give us three that you're looking forward to seeing. 
the film with Tom Hanks. The film it's a it's this thriller and it's called it's called it's called where I can't find it a hologram for the king. It's about a businessman doing business in Saudi Arabia. It, it's fascinating to me. Uh, Tribeca is a great event. It's a, a, a premier showcase for the independent film. Many years we never see the films again. Right. But this year there are so many films with big stars that we may see again. So for a star of the caliber of Tom Hanks to bring a film and to Nicole Tidrecula, Kidman has one that's Nicole coming out. Kidman has a film. Um, I, I can't wait to see the Elvis and Nixon yep. film. Kevin Spacey's Kevin Spacey <laughs> he's doing it now again. having been freed from his desire to play Bobby Darren is going to be chewing scenery again as a president of the United States, only this time an actual one. And Michael Shannon's going to be Elvis, and apparently it's based on a true story. When Elvis showed up at the White House and wanted to be deputized as a member of the Bureau of Narcotics or something like that in 1970. There's a lot of good ones, and uh, we'll be highlighting the festival next week on our show. Mark, as always, thank you for coming thank in you. and talking thank about musical you. biopics. We're going to keep music as the kind of theme of the show. We have Mary Jane Newman with the Sanctuary series coming up after the break. We'll see you on the other side. It's time to come back to hometown banking, where people are taken into account, not just balances, where community comes first, a place where there's more than one kind of interest, where automation will never replace consideration, where they not only know your name, they know your dog's name too. It's time to expect more. It's time to bank well. Bank smart. Bank local. Bank well. Walter Stewart's Market in New Canaan is your time-saving local shopping destination for the best of spring. Find many of your favorite products, from great specials on everyday items to the freshest organic produce, artisanal cheeses, and grass-fed steaks. Drop off your knives to be sharpened, grab a beautiful bouquet of spring flowers, and stop in next door for a wine tasting. Plus, their personal staff is always ready to lend a helping hand. So stop in to Walter Stewart's Market, 229 Elm Street, today, or shop online at stewartsmarket.com. Join the HAN Network and Make-A-Wish Connecticut to help make travel wishes come true for local kids with life-threatening medical conditions. Donate your unused airline miles to the HAN Network Wishes in Flight campaign. Over 70% of wishes granted involve travel, and your unused airline miles can help make kids' dreams become a reality. Plus, once you donate your miles to Make-A-Wish, they will never expire. Donate your unused miles and help the HAN Network share the power of a wish. What's happening up in Hartford and what's trending in the Nutmeg State? Join Kate Chaplinski and Josh Fisher on CT Pulse live Wednesdays at 12.30 to find out. We talk to the leaders and newsmakers while breaking down the stories you should be paying attention to each week. With the help of HAN's editorial cartoonist Doug Smith, we take a humorous look at the news of the week. We talk about everything you were told you should avoid bringing up in polite company. CT Pulse, Wednesdays at 12.30 on the HAN Network. You are watching the HAN Network, and you're not alone. Nearly half a million viewers enjoyed our broadcast in the first five months. Advertise on the network that reaches Fairfield County, Connecticut's most engaged audience. Contact Jessica Murren, Advertising Director, at 203-273-7312 or email jessica at han.network. You are watching... I'm joined on the couch with Mary Jane and Anthony Newman of the Sanctuary Series, which has been going on this spring. It kicked off March 20th, and you've got three more shows this weekend, Sunday at 3 p.m., uh, April 10th, April 24th, and then May 8th for the Mother's Day uh, finale. For those who are not familiar with the Sanctuary Series, uh, kind of bring us, I think it started five years ago. Correct. How did it start? Why did you want to get this kind of program launched in South Salem? It started five years ago with $250 from my checkbook. Uh, we, had, uh, we have a church there, the Presbyterian Church of South Salem, which has been... It's right there on Spring Street, right? On Spring Street. It's been since Revolutionary Days a, um, a center, kind of a cultural and community center, as well as being a church. And uh, the acoustics in the church happened to be excellent for music. So I was speaking with the uh, pastor there, who is also a musician. He's a guitarist in Chip Andrews. He's kind of a well-known person you know, around this area. Um, 
So I said to him, it would be great if we had some kind of a music series. So we investigated it, given how little money we had at the beginning. We thought the simplest and most cost-effective thing to do would be a piano series. So at the first concert, we had seven people. Oh my gosh, <laughs> and it's grown. It was a little discouraging, Yeah. but we, we had already hired two pianists. So at the second concert, we had about 40 people. So the seven people obviously each told, you know, six friends. The word of mouth. And um, we then thought, well, we'll give it another year. So we put together a small board. And uh, the second year, we had pretty good attendance, about 50 or 60 people at each concert. Third year, we did even better, fourth year better. So now it's become established and we're able last year and this year to get international talent. You've so, got a big one, a pianist. Uh, you Yun Chin Xiao. Xiao, thank you. He's coming up this month. That should be a great performance. He's on Sunday. Sunday, April 10th. Yeah, he, he's a winner of uh, Young Concert Artist Competition. There's his picture. That's Yun. He's a very cute little guy. Um, and uh, he's a staggering talent. I mean, he plays the absolute, you know what, out of the piano. And. Um, so I think anyone who is a fan of the piano, even if they're not a huge fan of classical music, will be just stunned by seeing him. He's fantastic. Now big, the, big talent. Now, does discovering these musicians and getting them to come up to upstate New York or to South Salem, does it bring you back at all to when you were a young musician and meeting? I'm still young. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it does bring me back, but the difference for me is that I always wished that there were people who trusted, uh, you know, trusted you even though you weren't well known. And it's kind of hard to find because what happens in music for producers is they want a sure thing. And that usually means someone with a name. And because we're smaller, we have the luxury of uh, giving the opportunity to perform to people who aren't already really draws. You know, just by your name, someone will come. My husband has a, a name in music. And you guys have been working together a lot throughout your careers, correct? Uh, yes, yeah. we've done a fair amount of less. double harpsichord stuff. We've never done a double piano, have we? Mm -hmm. Piano four hands. Piano four hands, yeah. yeah. At some lectures we've done that. And we did a live radio broadcast of the Bach double C major. Yeah. For national, we did the National Public Radio fundraiser a few years ago, which played on every station in the country. Yeah, NPR. NPR, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we played two harpsichords that night. That's right, which is really remarkable in a studio to get two harpsichords together. Yeah. And we also did a recording of box double concertos for two harpsichords. And you played the C minor concerto with me on, on my series. Yeah, and we played in Europe together. Oh, that's right, at the Madeira oh. Festival. And in Poland. And in Poland also. On so we've been all around the world together. Yes. Playing the music and passing the torch, so to speak. You're going to be performing with Eugenia Zuckerman, is that right, on yes, Mother's Day? Yes, that's right. And how did you discover her? Oh, that's a 25-year-old story. Way <laughs> that's 25 years. Well, here's the complete story, and I'll include Mr. Zhao on this. Uh, this all came through Young Concert Artists, mm -hmm. and that's an organization in New York that does just what you think it would do. They have competition. If you win it, you become a young concert artist, and they market you for a certain amount of time. So I was a young concert artist, well, it feels like 200 years ago. Uh, I would say in 1968, I became a young concert artist. And uh, Jeannie Zuckerman was also at, this, at that time a young concert artist. So of course, harpsichord and flute is a natural combination. So we met and then did a program at the 92nd Street Y. And then I actually wrote a lot of recommending letters for people that I thought were worthy of young concert artists. And one was Mr. Zhao, uh, who became a good friend. He's a very nice person. And so uh, he played and won the only, he was the only pianist that year to win. And uh, has won a lot of competitions and he's a lovely person too, so people would like to talk to him. He speaks very good English. And there is an opportunity for people that show up at the church to meet. There's of a reception, course. wine and cheese is wine it and afterwards? Wine and cheese afterwards, and they meet the artist. Right. And so it's a full afternoon. And uh, I think, as I say, I think even if you're just a little interested in classical music, this is a good way to 
take the leap and uh, in a very non-threatening environment and friendly feeling to it, followed by a reception, followed by the, the privilege, really, of meeting the artists. And um, so I would encourage people to, to come. And for tickets, it's 914-763-5402. Yes, or they can also email, online. Yep, or go to the website, which is thesanctuaryseries.org. .org. Right? Dot org dot or org. info at thesanctuaryseries.org. Dot org. Dot org, yes. So there's three ways to get tickets. Facebook page. Right. And, uh, and it's, yeah, it's easy to get tickets, and also you can come. It's, I think, $5 less if you get tickets online. Online, right, of course. Yeah. And the Presbyterian Church, again, is 111 Spring Street, Spring South Street. Salem. In the center, right in the center of South Salem. So even if you don't know the address, it's right off Route 35. Very easy to find. Yeah, it's easy. It, yeah, it's right there. It. You can't miss it. Mary Jane and Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the show. Such Three more pleasure. performances this spring. Again, Sunday, April 10th. Uh, 3 p.m. 24th at 3 p.m. 3 and then May 8th for the Mother's Day, which Mother's Anthony will be performing at. So and plenty more opportunities to hear the music. April 28th, I just want to say, Misha and Sipa Dichter. Okay. On April 28th. Oh, 28th. Am I giving the wrong date? I'm sorry. No. Or is it the 24th? Oh, 24th. It's Sunday the 24th? Yes. You're right. Okay. 3 p.m. Don't miss it. Right. SanctuarySeries.org. Buy your tickets now. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much for coming on. We're going to head to another commercial break, and we come back. Eric and I are going to break down uh, the DC and Marvel comic book worlds on film. Far out. Wow, oh, 25 great. years. Thank you. Mike Sizzik Painting and Wallpapering has been the name to know for residential and commercial properties in Fairfield County. He uses only the top brands, including Benjamin Moore, for impeccable preparation and lasting quality. Call Mike now and receive $500 off any job over $7,000. Mike is currently accepting reservations for spring, so call him today at 203-770-8869 or 203-770-8869. 972-3310. For your custom painting, finishing, and staining needs, it's Mike Sizik. At the Sylvan Learning Center of Darien, experienced teachers and personalized academic support equals superior results. Our certified teachers uncover skill gaps, address specific needs, and help students realize greater academic success and increased confidence. We're enrolling now. Individualized after-school tutoring and reading, math, history, elementary math, algebra, geometry, calculus, high school science, and study skills. For a free consultation, call 203-655-3276 or email gmcsylvan at gmail.com. Had a sports injury or a slip and fall that needs immediate care? Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care gives you direct access to an orthopedic specialist fast without an appointment. Biking, golf, tennis, soccer, whatever the sports injury is, sprain or fracture, Coastal Ortho Express can help. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care open Monday through Saturday in the I Park building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or go to CoastalOrthoExpress.com. That's CoastalOrthoExpress.com. Like them on Facebook. I'm Kate Chaplinski. Join us for Coffee Break weekdays at 11 to get the latest Connecticut news, weather, high school sports, and more. News doesn't get any more local than on Coffee Break on the HAN Network. I'm Denise DiGregoli, the host of The Drive on the HAN Network. Join me Tuesdays for some motivational, intelligent talk with a little humor as we visit with people who live their lives mindfully. Tune in to The Drive live on Tuesdays, 12.30, here on the HAN Network. I'm Denise. Welcome back to Arts and Leisure on the HAN Network. Steve Coulter here, joined on the couch with my director. I think you've been on the couch with us before, yes, right? Yes, once we before. We did Star Wars, we, right? We, we chatted uh, pre-Star <laughs> Wars. I nerded out then, and then I'm back to nerd out I was going to say, here we so. go. you got DC versus Marvel. Yes. You've got your Captain American shirt I on. I do, I do. As you can, uh, the spoiler alert here, which uh, side of this argument I'm going to be falling on, uh, <laughs> at least for the cinematic universe, we'll get into... Uh, definitely has to be Marvel, right? Yes, for you the got cinematic Civil War universe, coming out exactly. May 6th, next month, and then that comes on the heels of, obviously, yes. the D DC catastrophe that is... Batman versus we, we Superman. We got my lower third again, Eric Gendron, <laughs> nerd. So, yes. Thank you very much, AJ, for stepping <laughs> in back there. Uh, but, yeah, no, great, great to be back here on the couch with you, Steve. And, uh, yeah, uh, a, a topic I'm uh, quite passionate about is uh, all things nerd. And, uh, um, yeah, DC versus Marvel Cinematic Universes. And, um, you know, Marvel has really just hit every They've note. been building this for Perfectly. a decade now. Perfectly. And that, and that is really where we can start is just... 
you know, Batman vs Superman has been universally maligned and rightly so, I think, because Zack Snyder first. And well, foremost. we'll get to Zack Snyder <laughs> in a minute, but I think from a studio perspective, Warner Brothers has really they they want. Everybody wants what Marvel has and Disney has, and right they're now. trying to push it out as fast as as fast possible. as they can. And they're doing it wrong because Marvel has taken their time since two thousand five, six. I think it's two thousand six. I, I want to say it was two thousand six. Yeah, yeah, Iron Man came out. I saw that. I was a freshman in college when that came out, and you know, I saw it with all my roommates, and it was such a fun, fun movie. And you know, and this was, and has taken a decade to you know reach. And Robert Downey's so perfect. I mean, Downey was, was was born. I mean, they, they've even changed the design of Tony Stark to look more like Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. in the comics now. Um, and they've just done an almost flawless job uh, every step of the way. Their only misstep, I think, being probably Rhodey, okay. Rhodey, and Iron Man. They've had a change. Yeah, Iron Man Two was a little rough. Yep. Um, but I think Age of Ultron, you know, was a bit of. A, I had fun with Age of Ultron. Yeah, but me too. I, I get the missteps, and they're really, you know. Starting to have, uh, there was a little too much um, studio involvement, as Joss Whedon kind of uh, alluded right. to. He just was drained after the movie, and just, I mean, how many times is the studio going to mess with Joss Whedon? But that's another sto- uh, uh, story. <laughs> you for can get day. into it if you want. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> all the TV shows, the beloved TV shows that he had derailed, you know, by the studios, and he uh, once again had it. You know, he did, it, I think, the perfect. Superhero movie in the original Avengers, and then the studio got way too involved with, with Avengers too. With, with they H. wanted Ultron. to pack it full of all these side characters. Exactly. Regardless, yeah. though, I think the Russo brothers are picking up the torch perfectly. I think Winter Sol- Captain America: Winter Soldier was, I think, every, a lot of people's favorite movie in, in one the of Marvel my movie. favorites. Yes, comic book movies just for done sure. so well. And the Russo brothers have really just injected new and life they're doing into, Civil and they're War. doing Civil War right. as well. And they will also Which be doing... Which has like 16 lead yes. actors. Well, and they, and they're <laughs> also we be, they will also be doing Infinity War Parts 1 and 2, okay. which is uh, uh, rumored to have 67 characters in it. <laughs> so I we'll believe see. I checked out the IMDb the other day and I was just like, uh, who, who isn't in this movie? We will, we will see where we go with that. But, um, but you know, DC wants to get in on this and... They kind of had the separate, you know, Dark Knight trilogy, which wasn't really a DC thing. It was a Christopher Nolan thing, yeah. you know. And you can't. You and know, since and then, they've gone very far from that. Exactly. And that's only and been they, four years. And, and they want this this multiverse, like with you know, this huge characters and setting up a bunch of different, you know, um, films. But unfortunately, they have Zack Snyder at the reins, oh who I gosh. think is one of the worst. <laughs> I saw the 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 best comment on the internet was. Hollywood keeps going back to Zack Snyder hoping that lightning will strike once. Yeah. <laughs> he's never struck. He's ruined so many... And my line that I came up with about Zack Snyder is he's really good at making half of a movie. Yeah. I mean, you look at all his, at his films, 300 aside, I mean, he's kind of the M. Night Shyamalan of, of action movies, you know, where he had... That's actually he, a really good comparison. He had a, had a great hit in the very beginning. 300 is a, is a really fun, well done, action well movie, done yep. you know, kind of uh, out there action film, you know, it obviously has its flaws and, you know, and it has its, his criticism. And it came out of nowhere, kind of like Came out of nowhere, Sixth like Sixth Sense, did, yeah. exactly. And it was like, oh, this guy's the, the director of the future with all of his slow-mo punching. But then he ruined Watchmen. The first 25 <laughs> minutes of Watchmen are perfect. Perfect. And then it just, the, we- the wheels completely yeah. fell off. Of it, it gets so bad and, at the and, end. And, and he's also really... Well, and and then the, the Watchmen trailer, I think, is still one. I still watch the the trailer yeah, for Watchmen. Yeah, I was more excited about that movie than oh, any movie that year. That is that and may be. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll someday when we'll talk about bad trailers and good trailers, the Watchmen trailer <laughs> is my favorite trailer of talk all time. Talk about getting you in the oh, theater. Perfect. <laughs> well, maybe until Force of the Force Awakens trailer, but um, so anyways, he ruined Watchmen. Man of Steel was her- uh, horrendous after Zod comes down, and, my- and nothing against Michael Shannon. I love Michael Shannon. It's just so over the top. It's the just action so is great. over the, the top. The action in that movie is more over the top than like Fast and the Furious. He, he builds like this very uh, contemplative film, right? And then he proceeds to beat you over the head with a sledgehammer, and that's exactly, for no reason. Either. For no reason, and that is apparently exactly what what happens with Batman vs Superman. Um, Everyone who asks me why I'm not going to see it, it's just like I have one answer: Zack Schneider. I Zach will not exactly. get And one as it's not Batfleck. I hear Ben Affleck is actually the saving grace of, yeah. the, of the movie, and I'm actually kind of stoked for the. I'd Bat- be there if it wasn't Zack Schneider. If yeah. they had another director, I would I'm actually kind of stoked it. that that Ben Affleck is going to write and direct and star in his own 
Batman. Really? Movie. That is the next step. So that's a passion have, project. Have another solo Batman film, and and Affleck is going to, <laughs> despite the protestations of our, our stand-in director AJ Simonowski, uh, Bat Affleck is going to write, direct, and star in a Bat solo Batman movie, which I'm actually pretty excited about. Um, I think Latter Day Bat uh, Affleck post J Lo has uh, he's he's, oh, yeah. had a, he's, he's had a renaissance. He's killing it. I think. Yeah. Um, but One of the best directors in the business, I'd argue, right now. So I think what Warner Brothers needs to do is they need to take a minute, step back. Which they won't do. They won't, will <laughs> not do this. They will absolutely not do this. And they're probably going to let Zack Snyder direct another film. They're probably going to let him stay with the Justice League. Even oh, movie. he'll probably do Aquaman, right? <laughs> well, they are doing an Aquaman film with Jason Momoa, but that's neither here nor there. Um, they're going to let Zack Snyder do the, the, the Justice League movie, and it's going to be horrendous. But what they should do is realize that they can't catch up to Marvel Take your time. Right. You're not going to have that. You, the Justice League is not going to go up against Infinity War and win. Infinity War, we'll, we'll say. It's been a uh, long time coming for exactly, that. Movie. Exactly. So, DC, you need to take your own time and be on your own timeline. And if it that takes going to the year 2025, which is. I'm glad you, know, you mentioned nine that because that's away, probably the right target. Because that's, exactly. what, 10 years Exactly, from yeah. So you know, take your time and build up to Justice League like you did. I mean, you, DC has such a rich universe. You got The Flash. You got Green Lantern, who can be done well, <laughs> not in that crappy Ryan Reynolds movie. And then you've got Wonder Woman, who will have her own... Right, she's got her own know, coming and, out. And, and for whatever reason, Hollywood cannot figure out how to do a Superman movie. Well, Hollywood go back to the Green Lantern, though, or is that, that's got to be done right? After <sighs> I mean, the maybe they'll bring him up, but clearly, I mean, they're talking about Aquaman and Cyborg at this point. So okay. you know, they clearly, you know, they're trying to stay away from, from Green Lantern, and you know, and obviously Ryan Reynolds made the great dig at, yeah. at, at himself in in, uh, in Deadpool. You gotta love um, that. Um, but uh, but really, if you want good DC, you gotta go to television. You have to go to tell DC on television is is fantastic now and early, previously. Um, the animated universe is still, I still hold near and dear to my heart. I still think the animated Batman series, the animated Superman series from the early early mid '90s, was one of the it's had some of the oh, best the stories on so television. Great, oh, yeah. the Batman one is fantastic. I mean, Kevin Conroy is still one of the definitive voices of Batman. Mark Hamill, yes, but that Mark Hamill <laughs> was the voice of the Joker. We're gonna get to him in a little. Was bit. the voice of the Joker? <laughs> Is the voice of Joker? Excuse me, excuse me. Yes, it's uh, still uh, still featured in the Arkham uh, video game series, and will be coming back one more time for the Killing Joke, which they're going to have an animated version of the Killing Joke, which I'm so stoked for. Um, and uh, so yeah, if you want good DC animated universe and all and Arrow and the Flash and Suicide on CW. Squad is DC, right? Yeah, I am. I'm, I think they might have a nice bounce back with Suicide Squad because it's not Zack Snyder. Yeah, I was gonna say they've got the director this time, yeah. David Ayer, right? I'm, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna good. give it. I'm gonna give it a shot. I liked the trailer for it. I know some people are really against it over there, <laughs> um, but I'm gonna give it a shot. I think it looks. It just looks more fun. Definitely, than, you know, because that's what what makes Marvel movies great. Batman vs Superman fun. just looks so serious, it's just so somber, and just ah, oh, yeah. I mean, I know we were all going for the gritty reboot thing, you know, for a while there, and Nolan they're pulled trying, it off. Yeah, they're trying to go Nolan, but exactly. only Nolan can go. Only Nolan, Nolan can be Nolan, and right. at this point, I think, and um, just you know. I, I think hopefully it's not too late because they're starting on shaky ground with this one, yep. but maybe they'll catch up and maybe they'll take their time. I, I recently came across um, Spider-Man. The original Spider-Man was on TV. Great the, movie. One, the one with uh, uh, Tobey Maguire and uh, the Green Goblin. I can't remember his name at the moment. James Franco. No, the other one. The one that was William before Defoe. him. Defoe. William Defoe. Thank you. The original 2002 uh, yeah. Spider-Man. And it was just, it was a little hokey, but it was fun. Oh, yeah. You forget how, you know, how fun superhero movies can be and how perfect Sam Raimi was for, as yeah. a director for Spider-Man. so ideal. Until he lost his mind in the third one. But the third one's one of the worst uh, movies of all time. Don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> uh, but you just forget that superhero movies are supposed to be fun. And speaking of fun. Oh, great transition. Great transition, right? Rogue One. Oh. Trailer dropped today. Oh, my God. Oh Felicity my God, I'm Jones. So excited. I'm so Queen excited. Felicity Jones. So I know a lot of people are going to have complaints that Disney is going is inundating us with Star Wars films. From but here this until is totally Eternity. different than Force Awakens. Yes. It's, oh, it looks so good. I am so excited about this. Um, it's just something different. It's out of the you know it's it's expanding the universe of Star Wars beyond the expanded universe. Now, for those who don't know, you've got to yes. tell us what time frame this so is. So Rogue in. One is uh, going to be about the rebels who stole the plans of the Death Star. That right. first line 
in the first two lines a new in, hope. in A New Hope, yep. the, original, the original Star Wars film, Rebel it's Spies, now, now a movie. Rebel <laughs> Spies, striking from a secret base, have won their first victory against the evil empire. They have stolen plans for, evil, for the ultimate battle station, the Death Star. There's your plot for the movie, and it's going to be about those rebels who stole the plans for the Death Star. I see nothing wrong. Oh, <laughs> and it's just, I mean, you had an actress playing Mon Mothma, the, the rebel leader, who looks exactly like the woman from Return of the Jedi, which yeah. is insane. I thought it was like a CGI. The cast is I thought it was a CGI recreation of her when I first saw it. <laughs> AT-AT is rumored to going to have Darth Vader and Boba Fett in it. It's, I mean, what can go wrong? So, I mean, I, I'm pretty excited for it. Did you see the trailer for it? I did. I did see it this morning. I thought it was great. And my brother actually just called me. Oh, we and gotta play the this, this, this was his voicemail he just left me upon watching it. Ah, the Rogue One trailer. So good. The Star Wars. The Star Wars everywhere. We're getting Star Wars every year. I love it. I like Star Wars and I want it to stay. No, no more no Star Wars. You can fly all Star Wars. You gotta be taking good for Star Wars and I'll never stop Star Wars. <laughs> He's got to come on the couch. One He's day. nuts. He's yeah. He lives out in Los Angeles. He does uh, uh, improv comedy and stand-up comedy out there. So he's uh, he's a funny guy. But, he's more uh, excited than anybody. Oh uh, well, that was slight exaggeration. Oh okay. yes, yes, yeah. He's making but a joke. Exactly. Yeah. So as he is wont to do. But uh, yeah, no, that's uh, very excited for that. And um, no, I, you How know, can until, you not be? It looks awesome. I, 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 I'm until they prove me wrong. Until they you know show me a terrible movie, I'm I'm gonna go see it. But it looked looked pretty fun. Oh, so. definitely. So. Eric, as always, thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you for having me, Steve, for uh, uh, nerding out. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was a good session. And uh, we'll be back next week with uh, Arts and Leisure on the HN Network. Thanks for watching, and uh, see you next week.